Good morning. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get comfortable, we will be getting started here shortly. Yeah, a nice little one. Good morning. It is 10 o'clock and we're going to go ahead and call the Castle Hills Special City Council meeting to order and determine if a quorum is present. We have a present quorum. Can you hear me? Okay, it's on. Um, we're going to call the Castle Hills Special Council meeting to uh, order. It's 10, oh, 10 o'clock and we will get started. Uh, before we get started, there's a couple things that I wanted to clarify. Thank you all so much for being here. I enjoy seeing people engaged and interested in their city government. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to start off by hearing from the developer, then we'll hear from our, the city's bond council, and then we'll proceed with questions. Uh, it's important to note that no action has been taken to approve this development and that the city of Castle Hills council members are working very hard and do louder. Will you go back up? Rapidly, can we turn up the volume, please? Okay, thank you, Brother Dueling. So it's important to note that we've been working very hard to ensure that we are discussing this because this is not something that we do all the time. As such, this is the sixth meeting that the city of Castle Hills has had about this. All the meetings have been posted. All of them have been recorded. All of them have been available to be viewed online. It started October 13th, November 1st, December 7th, January 11th, February 22nd, and today, March 5th. That's the sixth meeting. Today, just like the last town hall has been all about the residents. This is not an opportunity for council members to talk. This is for you to ask questions, share your concerns, and have our uh, subject matter experts be able to answer those questions and or concerns. One of the criticisms we had last time was that people that were viewing online were not able to hear. So we're gonna ask that if you don't have the microphone, please don't talk. We're trying to make sure that if you're viewing online that you can hear the questions and you can hear the answers. This is Amarone. We'll be walking around with the microphone and that way we can have a nice orderly meeting where everybody can hear, learn, and get educated as to what's going on. That being said, we will open up with the first agenda item. A presentation by representatives from Vaquero Multifamily on proposal for the lofts at Castle Hills. Hello. Hi, my name is Jared Thierith. I'm Senior Vice President with Vaquero Ventures. We're proposing an approximately 300 unit uh, multifamily building um, at the corner of Winston, or I guess between Lock Hill and, and Military. And Winston, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the project. <clears throat> uh, again, it's approximately 300 units, uh, four stories. There's a parking garage, so it's, it's called a wrap. There's a parking garage in the middle, a four and a half story. Uh, you won't be able to see the garage as we have surrounded it with units. Um, you know, there will be some hardscaping and some landscaping here at the corner, uh, the hard corner of military and Winston right there. I'll show you a rendering in just a second of it. We've got the pool courtyard in the middle. <clears throat> uh, there's a dog park back here. 
the garage entrance and exit will be here. We're proposing it to be here and kind of centrally located along North Winston Lane. You'll see that there's a drive back here. Uh, that is for emergency services, back of house, so trash, and then all the move-ins. You cannot enter or exit the garage. It, it kind of deadens there. Uh, the dog park is kind of sandwiched right here in this green area. Uh, and then the amenities and clubhouse will be in this kind of, I guess, green area right here, this blue-green area. Um, there will be a, a golf simulator we're proposing, a fitness center, um, the clubhouse, a billiards room. Kind of that will all be here. The office will be here, the hard corner, you know, right here with, you know, we're considering this our main drive by right here at this corner. Um, let me show you the rendering real quick. Might be hard to see. Let me let me hold it up. This perspective, we're standing at the, the, the corner of military and Winston right here. You can see we're proposing some festoon, some festoon lighting. Uh, there's, you know, it's there's a pretty big setback right there that will have some landscaping and the hardscaping, as I mentioned. The leasing office you can see would be right here near that corner, uh, the garage. It's kind of cut off, but it would be a little bit <coughs> down here along, along Winston. Um, we're proposing a little bit more glazing along the ground floor, trying to bring something urban, contemporary here. You know, there's currently no sidewalk or lighting along Winston. It looks like a, a, a dark alley in the evening. So, you know, not only will we have nice decorative street lighting, there will also be a lot of ambient lighting from the balconies and from the building itself as well. You can kind of see some of the, the lights. It may be hard, but, it, you know, we've got them there and there. Um, we'll also bring the sidewalk around Lock Hill as well, make it a little bit more uh, pedestrian friendly at this intersection, this, this area of, of, of Castle Hills. Um, you know, 10 foot ceilings. Uh, let me show you some, some finishes real quick. These are, these are conceptual. This is what we're proposing right now. <clears throat> um, so this is a bathroom, just a, a sample bathroom. You know, Frameless shower enclosures, um, some nice cabinetry, uh, quartz countertops, frame mirrors might be a little bit hard to see, some decorative lighting, um, flooring, uh, you know, tiled bathroom, something that you'd see in Alma Heights or the Pearl, uh, Stone Oak, Lock and Terra, the rim area. So just a conceptual lobby right here, you know, you enter, you know, lots of glass, two stories, you'd see the pool beyond, uh, leasing office would be over here on the right side. Um, you know, the billiards room would be back on the right or, or the left possibly, you know, it's very fluid right now, very conceptual, but just to give you an idea, this is, this is something similar to, to what we're proposing here. Uh, conceptual kitchen, uh, again, quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances, uh, and here we're showing back painted glass, uh, subway tiles, uh, decorative lighting, um, pretty light colored paint scheme. Usually we'll do two, two different schemes on the cabinetry. This one, we just rented a, a light one, but usually we'll do a light and a dark. Uh, very contemporary, as you can see, you know, you have the wood look flooring down here and the corner might be hard to see. Um, maybe we can get gas, gas, uh, uh, ranges, which would be nice, but something similar to that. Um, and then lots of glazing. It's kind of hard to tell on this, but, you know, lots of windows throughout, lots of natural light. And let me see. I think we've got. That's yeah. So that's everything. Um, so they we have we don't know yet, but obviously they'll be somewhere in here, you know, probably here near the leasing office, which is where we typically would put them. And then on the opposite side. So, you know, we, we haven't got that detailed yet, but I would envision somewhere down here, we'll have a couple, and then up here, we'll have a couple. Again, this is the leasing office and the, and the kind of the club room and, and uh, amenities in that, in that corner. Hey, Mr. Thierry, as soon as you're done, then we can take uh, field questions, and we'll have Mr. Zamaron go around with the mic. Okay. That, that, uh... Good morning. My name is Scott Brimer, and uh, I'm the president of Vaquero Multifamily. And um, and I, I kind of wanted to address a couple of elephants in the room um, right off the bat because okay, I, I'd like to address a couple of elephants in the room right off the bat. 
so we could, um, uh, you know, keep the uh, conversation as productive as possible during the Q&A part of this. This, uh, we had mounted, as I understand it, has been disseminated to around the community and to different homes in the community. And about the only thing that's correct on here is how you spell Castle Hills. Um, I, I, a few things that I would like to point out. This is not a low-income housing project. This project will not accept Section 8 vouchers. It never has, never will. Uh, there are not 600 to 900 people living here based on our years of experience developing. The number of people will be 450-ish. Um, we are not using your taxpayer dollars to fund this. We're getting a tax abatement of all of the property taxes that are in this, uh, in this jurisdiction. And very simply, if you just looked at it from the tax standpoint, these are the two properties that we're buying here and here. Last year, the city of Castle Hills received a total of $1,037 on this piece of property, and it received a total of $6,822 on this piece of property for just under $8,000. And my guess is if you look back 25 years, it would have been a little bit less each prior year. On the first day that we close this transaction, the city will receive 30 times what it currently receives on this piece of property through the fee that you receive a loan. 30 times what you get. So it's a, it's a, it's, it may be factually correct that property taxes, there will be no property taxes here, but there's, it's, a, it's a horse of a different color. You're receiving 30 times just at the closing what you'll receive, what you've received for the past 30 years on this property. So um, th 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 those are, I think, some very key critical uh, points to this. You also receive a very significant um, uh, uh, part of the proceeds when this project sells. And you will also receive, once this building is built, 25% of what the overall tax taxes would have been will go directly to Castle Hills. While that won't be in the form of a tax payment, that, and, and I don't mean just cash, Castle Hills portion, I mean the total amount of the taxes, if this were built, the $60 million project, you'll receive 25% of what the taxes would have been, which is over $200,000 in our estimation, probably closer to $250,000. So just by this getting here, you've, you, you've done 30X better than you have last year. You have, uh, and you're gonna receive once it's built, at least $250,000 a year in lease payments that are guaranteed. So I thought if we'd started there, you could at least get your arms around what the economic proposition was. You may not like the project, you may not like the traffic, you may not like the design, you may not like us, but at least those things are, are, are factual. And, uh, and I just wanted to address that. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so what we'll do now is we will have Mr. Zamarone go by. You can ask a question and then the representatives will, well, do we wanna, Mr. Uh, Brimer, do you wanna wait till we do each one? Or do you wanna wait till the end? Uh, in terms of answering questions? Yes, sir. Oh, no, I think we should just do it at, at this, at all, all right now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll have Mr. Brimer stay at the podium and Mr. Zamorón will go with the mic. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and we'll go from there. Good morning to all. I'm a um, resident of Castle Hills and reside on Prince. Uh, as a commercial loan consultant, I've been very engaged in the Echo East project for the George Gervin Youth Center. 
and Texas Representative uh, Barbara Hawkins, which is, will be the East Side Pearl. Would you please elaborate to us? Um, you did mention that there will be no Section 8 housing. However, what will be the percentage of units for market rate versus affordable rate housing? Sure. Uh, the way the statute is currently written, um, we're, we are supposed to reserve 50% of the units to folks making 80% or less of AMI. And 80% of AMI uh, in, in San Antonio, in, in this region, is about $60,000 a year. So we envision 50% of the units being reserved for folks making $60,000 or less, um, depending on the size of the unit. Um, but those are first responders, um, teachers, uh, police officers. I think your starting patrolman salary uh, here in Castle Hills is 42,000, I believe. Uh, that would be an ideal resident for, for one of our smaller units. Um, and and, and that's, the, that's the ratio. Sir can, sir, can we get you to use the mic? All we need to do is raise your hand, Mr. Zamaroon, we'll get to you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Just your name and address, please. Sure, uh, my name is Mike Schneider. I live on uh, Northcrest. And um, I understand there's a CIP involved in this. I would like for you to expand on that. And also there, that relationship with uh, the board that would be created uh, here in Castle Hills. Okay, is CIP, is that the community development plan? I, I don't, I've not heard of a CIP. Ms. Brimer, I think it's a community improvement plan and that's uh, more from infrastructure improvement for the city of Castle Hills, not necessarily associated with this development. Okay. So uh, the, the, uh, the PFC will be owned by the city of Castle Hills. So the, uh, your, your um, council will appoint the board in many cases, it, 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 it's often the city council. In other, time, in other cases, they appoint different members to that. It just depends on your city council. How many projects similar to this one in all the phases that you've discussed have you developed before this? Okay, I've done four of these. Are um, they still functioning? Are the apartments full? Uh, the The... So I did them in my previous employer, which I started the first one three years ago, and it's at Calabra in 1604, and it is experienced the quickest lease up that um, that that I've ever been involved with. Uh, the the others are under construction right now. We left and went to work for Vaquero in May of last year, so we we haven't seen all the projects. Uh, Vaquero has no history of doing this before this. Vicaro does not have history of doing this. I have a history and my team has a history of doing this. We all left the same company and came to work at Vicaro. And you're looking at Castle Hills underwriting your construction costs with their corporation. Um, my, uh, Castle Hills, because of the statute is providing a tax abatement to the transaction. And that tax abatement allows us and our investment group to feel comfortable to build the project here. So we're not receiving any um, capital from you all, except for the elimination of the property tax. And as I said earlier, last year, the total tax on this parcel was $8,000. So yes, you're giving up $8,000 to get back if you believe what we what we project well, my concern is that y'all are structuring this just like the deal that the city of san antonio did for the grand hyatt hotel which cratered in the last few days and they the city of san antonio ended up spending 10 million dollars to pay the bonds that were underwriting the construction of that last year um, i don't think the city of castle hills needs to get into a situation like that where it basically comes to the homeowners in Castle Hills to pay for it. That is, that is, um, with all due respect. With all due respect, that is just incorrect. And I'll tell you why it's incorrect. And I, and I, and I'm not trying to be argumentative at all. Whatever structure they did in the city of San Antonio, 
I have a feeling San Antonio bonds were issued to support that project. Okay. So San Antonio put their investment grade rating on the line and told everybody who funded the project, we're going to pay this if the project fails. What's different about this is there is no pledge. There's no, if this project turned, if, if it went, if it, if it, if it went horribly wrong, there wouldn't be any financial implication to you all. Yes, you would have an eyesore there, which I think is your real risk. Is if, if I'm looking at what the real risks on this are, if we failed and the project sat there and it looked horrible, that would be your risk as a community. There, nobody could, there's no obligation on the city's part. There's no material, there, there's no monetary guarantees at all that the city makes. That's the beauty about this type of structure. And how in the world is this apartment complex that you're gonna build last for 75 years? Well, you know, you can um, go look at Sunset Ridge Shopping Center that was built in the 40s. It's been, it, that, that I know it's been remodeled three or four times. Um, you know, it's, it, look, it, at some point you, you, in any structure that you develop, you're going to have a useful life of that structure. And I'm not smart enough to predict if what it will look like in 75 years. I do know there are plenty of Chateau de Jean is probably 50 years old. Looks great. Sunset Ridge looks great. It, in fact, it just sold for a huge price. Um, uh, to, to, to an investment group. Well, sure. But, but we're talking about the physical, you asked me what it will look like in 75 years. And I'm giving you some examples. Yes. I think, um, if we could do this, this gentleman had his hand up earlier, the mic is over there. If we could come back and uh, to you, I think that would be we want to make sure we give everybody enough time to, to ask their questions. We want to make sure we give everybody enough time to ask their questions. So if you could please be mindful of that, Mr. Zamaron. Yeah, sure. Do I move the microphone here? Sure. All right. Scott, uh, I'm Guy Stidham, 303 Wickford Way. So when you're talking about 80% of AMI, who underwrites that? Does like the leasing office automatically get the application and figure that out like yeah um yes yeah, nice to see you by the way yeah it's a chart right i mean is that because that uh, yeah. seems i mean yeah. i don't think 80 percent of ami is sixty thousand for one person i think it's a lot lower so um the way we're doing this deal the ami in san antonio is seventy four thousand four hundred dollars for one person or a family so in this particular deal there is no adjustment for family size so when you adjust for family size, then you do have to consider, you know, a two, two person, uh, household, um, can't have more than 80% of that number. So that would be two people making $30,000 essentially. But in this transaction, the way we're, we've structured it with the city of Castle Hills, or at least the way we've proposed it to the city of Castle Hills, there is no adjustment for family size. So, um, so you could have a family of seven making $60,000. You could, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't meet our leasing standards to, to, to put that many folks in a, how many uh, three bedroom units are going to be in this development? 12. That's not bad. Um, so what's the percentage that's hard, uh, that's written hard in the contract for when the property sells, which it's going to, that's mm -hmm. the whole purpose of this exercise. Correct. Five years from now. Is there a hard number written in to what our spiff is for the city when it sells? You what get, is that factor? You get 25% of the profit after we get a preferred return of 8% and our capital back. And you get 25% of that, just like we earn our, our, our promotes in the transaction. Give or take, as well. what do you think that number is? I mean, if you're just doing it today. Uh, so if, I, if it were up today and we were selling it today, you, it would probably be seven million dollars to you guys. That's a lot of money. But I, I, don't, I can't speculate as to what it'll be in five I think years. It'll be good. So lastly, I was glad to see the renderings where it had um, 
this is small, but um, most of the units are closer to Lock El Selma than they are to Northwest Military. So um, all of these are scheduled to go to Castle Hills Elementary, correct? The, they would be. So that is Larkspur, not Castle Hills Elementary. Do we know that? I, 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 I actually don't know the answer to the question. I would think it is Castle Hills because Larkspur has to be on the other side of Lock Hill Selma. I, I would, just, just I would, I would have know. assumed it was Castle Hills as well. All right. How many, what's your estimated um, of all the units? What is your um, forecast uh, based upon previous things that you built at your other company? How many of them have uh, school age kids that would go to Castle Hills Elementary in your estimation? I don't think you'll have more than uh, 10 kids in this uh in in this no guys it's project. okay i mean he's being honest but yeah all right i i i don't what do y'all think i i mean it, it is this is an urban yeah go ahead thank you yeah on a national basis for apartment projects uh, on a national basis for apartment projects, the statistic is take all the two bedroom, all the three bedrooms units, that's about 100 units in this project, and approximately 25% of them will have a school aged child. So the national statistic would say 25 children out of this project. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I based my, my, uh, my answer to that question on the location, uh, the school district, the um, the type of units that we're going to have. I think this is this is this is not being marketed to families. The amenity set within the project. So, all right. I had a couple of questions. My name is Amy McClin. I live at 105 Villa Ann. I'm currently the chairman of our um, comprehensive plan advisory committee. And in January, we were tasked by council to help put together the actual document that council has to adopt in order for this to actually happen. And that's a community development program. And um, we have been working very hard on this. And what I wanted to let everyone know is there are a few statistics that I think we need to understand as we look at this project. According to, this, to the census that was done in 2020, our median income in the city of Castle Hills is only 96,848. The interesting fact is that for families of married couples, it's $129,773. But for non-family households, our median income is $47,083. You can look this up on the um, US Census information to verify that. So we are talking about a project that could potentially help residents that we have now. We are not a rich city like we think we are. Um, Castle Hills Elementary is also not at capacity. They could easily handle 25 kids or even 50 probably. They haven't been operating at capacity for a while. Um, we are working very hard as a committee to make sure that council has got all of the tools that they need to vet this project because we are very familiar that the citizens are concerned about safety. We're concerned about traffic. We're concerned about drainage. We're concerned about trees. We're concerned about green spaces. So there are a lot of people working to make sure that council has the tools it needs and the developers are given a fair opportunity to present this proposal, which, you know, if it fits the city, maybe it's a great idea or maybe it's not. But I think we, we, we need to make sure that we are giving these people the opportunity to present the information and that we fairly consider what they're saying in a respectful manner. But there are a lot of citizens that are working to make sure that we as citizens have the tools and council have the tools they need to make a good decision for our city. And I, and I would just like to add to that, if I could, from the get go, we, we have not wanted to try to steamroll anybody in this community over this project. If this is something that you're interested in doing, we're interested in doing it here. I think it'd be a fantastic uh, use for this property. But, but we're not, you know, a developer who's trying to come in and manipulate the facts, say things to our benefit. I, I, I'd rather not do the deal than have everybody upset in this community. So that's just that's how I feel. 
Good morning. My name's Ione McGinty. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live on Townview, and uh, our family has owned four lots on Townview for almost 60 years. So we have never gotten a tax abatement. We've always paid our property taxes. And it's uh, no uh, surprise to anybody that the property taxes in Bear County are out of control. Uh, Bear County was just named this past week the most dangerous city in Texas or the county. It's the most dangerous, okay, because of policies that have been in uh, effect recently, you know, anyway. So um, my, I would like to know without the tax abatement on this property, how much, how, what would be the amount of taxes that would be owed to the city or the county sure. without an abatement? Sure. So um, I'm going to give you round numbers because I don't have the percentages committed to memory. But if this were up and built and, and it was a $60 million valuation, let's say that generated $1.3 million in taxes in total property tax. The city of Castle Hills would receive about 21% of that. So that's roughly $300,000 or or two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, the city would receive. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the county would receive. Do you know what the mill rate is on the county? What's the probably a dollar fifty? Well, the, 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 the county would receive, um, the, you know, the lion's share, the school district, I'm sorry, would receive the lion's share of that, probably a dollar uh, per hundred. So that might be uh, a million dollars, uh, you know, a million dollars of that the city would receive, or 700,000, the city would receive 200,000, the county might receive 200,000, uh, the hospital district would receive a smaller amount, et cetera. So, the city of Castle Hills under that scenario would get roughly two, $250,000. So <clears throat> you're asking to not pay taxes on this property for 75 years. And <clears throat> that would deny Bear County, basically you're saying a million dollars or how much a year in taxes? The, the school district. The school district, but in total on a $60 million property, what do you estimate your yearly taxes would be to the county? Uh, to the county, again, I don't have the percent, but you call it $300,000 to the county. The lion's share of it would go to the, the school district. Okay. All right. So it's hard. It's, it, yeah. so, so you're asking to basically the citizens to absorb that and the investors in this project receive a profit off of their investment, but how does that benefit us? Well, the taxpayers who have to, you know, every year fight our property taxes because they're out of control. Because you're getting 25% of what the property taxes would have been. The Is city. that a one-time deal? No, that's an annual fee. That's an annual amount that's going to the city of Castle Hill. An annual fee of what? How much? Well, it, let's just use a million dollars because right. it's simple just, math. It'd be $250,000 a year to the city of Castle Hills. For 75 years? Yes. If well, you please use a microphone. Yeah, I don't know what the inflation You'd have to see, you know, it's hard to we tell. Really, we really need to keep the side conversations to a minimum. At a minimum, it'd be 25% if that were up and built and there was a million dollar total tax bill, the city of Castle Hills will receive $250,000 via a ground payment. Okay. So I think I said $300,000 to Bear County, it'd be $270,000 to Bear County. 
Uh, but the city of Castle Hills would receive $250,000 if there were a million dollars in property taxes assessed on this property. Uh, so over 75 years, that's what you would receive as a minimum um, each year. And when these sell, you also get 25% of the net profit that the partnership receives, which could be anywhere from, let's just say three to $7 million, depending on the market conditions. I believe that will happen at least three times, maybe more over the life of the 75 year transaction because people come in and they invest capital in real estate and they look to, re they look to uh, revert it and sell it to somebody else. So you get the, the, the economic deal for Castle Hills is, is, is a no brainer. It's, it's a really, really excellent transaction. What I can't answer for your community is, do you like the traffic? Do you like the looks of the facility? Do you like, you know, uh, the, the impact that it has on your community? I can't answer that for you all. Economically, I can with certainty tell you this is a, a much better deal by virtue of the fact that you're getting 30 times what you got last year just at the first closing. So it, you can say a lot about the project. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like it, but you, the economics are, 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 you're monetizing the rest of the tax, tax uh, base for your city. Uh, we're, we're still going, uh, Mr. Bella, go ahead. Hi, I wanted to uh, say, my name's Pete Bella. I live at 110 Hibiscus. And uh, I guess I really wanted to address the citizens as much as, Okay, sorry. My name is Peter Bella. I live at 110 Hibiscus Lane. And uh, I wanted to address the citizens as much, first of all, as the council or Mr. Brimer, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, I'm not in favor of the project right now. I'm not against the project. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a traffic analysis that includes traffic going through South Winston and into Fox Hall and into uh, West Castle Lane and some of that. Uh, we also have an understanding that there will be other reports that they will be producing. So I also wanted to say that um, I appreciate the openness. I appreciate your questions. You've had some really great questions so far, and I know that they will continue. I appreciate your concern because I'm a citizen too, and I get it. Do I want this? Do I not want this? My thought is that I am not... I'm both very thankful to Vaccaro and their willingness to meet with us. They first met with citizens over west of West Avenue on October 2nd, before the, even the first city council meeting. And the reason they did that is because the group of us over west of West Avenue have opposed a series of projects. The reason there's no basis school at the location for the first Castle Hills Baptist Church is because we said no. The reason that there are not 16 lots on less than five acres across the street from where I live on Hibiscus, instead there are a few family residences. There was a, a developer who wanted to move in and put 16 lots on less than five acres across on Hibiscus. We said no. So there have been a series of efforts that we have made a name for ourselves, let's say. Scott and some of the folks from Valcaro came to us on October 2nd. So while we do have questions about traffic, we do have questions about um, the, the uh, one-off, I think that'll be fine. Frankly, it's on the other side of the crown of, of a military highway. I don't think that'll be an issue. But the bottom line is that we also are waiting. So what that means is that you're, I'm really glad you're here and I'm really glad you're asking questions. And I'm really glad you're involved. So thank you, thank you frankly to Vaccaro and to the city council. When he says, when the mayor says six meetings, and it took more than that for the rural residential district, which at our request, the city council passed. So there's good history here for good citizen involvement. And I'm glad to see you here. Thank you. This is actually been waiting. Good morning. My name is Jacqueline Ackley from 118 West Castle Lane. Two, one question, one comment, please. Um, I am 
continuing to be concerned about the ratio of parking to units, which is 450 parking places to 300 units, a ratio of 1.5. I found a comparable article. I think to be comparable, the data has to reflect San Antonio because we have the spread out town, we have scant public transportation. Most people in this town get around using their own private vehicles. And um, the article I read was written by a group out of the Concord building right over here near the airport. And they built class A apartments and they recommended a ratio between 1.6 and 1.8, which doesn't sound hugely different from 1.5, but mathematically that's a difference of between 45 and about 90 parking spaces for this place. I really, really, really wish you would add at least the 1.6, make there more guest parking on top of the proposed 451 parking spaces, make additional space for guests. These people will have company come in for Christmas, holidays. They'll have significant others come in on the weekends. Um, there's gonna have to be overlap between caretakers and when mom gets home to take over toddler care. There's just got to be some breathing room. And the way that the units are designed, that this lot is so built up that there won't be any room for adding a few parking places here or there on the grounds later. What we get is what we get, and it'll have to serve for 75 years. Please consider increasing the number of parking places. My question is this, it's been alluded to today and then once before in another meeting that the leasing standard would not allow, say that proposed family of seven living in the three bedroom apartment. Could we be completely open about what this leasing standard says for how many occupants we're going to have in a one, two, or three bedroom apartment. Yes, that'll be in the um, in the property management agreement that we that we have. Um, we allow uh, two people per bedroom. Um, so that's what we will do. Our history and our experience tells us that it's generally not like that, uh, especially with the types of units that we're designing. Um, so I, you know, we, we, I, I can't tell you it won't be two people per bedroom, but, um, my experience tells me that it, that, that, uh, the, the, the ratio that we're assuming at 1.5 will be the number. And, and it, I, I bet if we all come back here three years from now and look at it, uh, we'll, we'll find that that's going to be the case. Um, I also, uh, we'll look at the parking. It, it is a, it is a uh, very difficult um, analysis to make on the parking with costs and all of that parking is an expensive uh, uh, part of, of, of any community. My personal belief on the parking is um, we're all gonna be doing parking and driving and living differently. Uh, 10, 15 years from now that we can't even imagine what that'll be like. But I think that'll reduce stress on, on, on parking everywhere. Hi, my name is Karen Waddell. I'm at 149 Lujan. Um, so I would like to be a little more clarify. We've talked about the, um, for minimum income, 60,000 is that number. I'm assuming there's probably some sliding scale for mm -hmm. on rent for what those people actually may. Is that true? No. So no. Um, the, the, the minimum, in order to receive the tax abatement, we, um, we have to reserve 50% of the units for people making 80% of AMI. That number is $60,000. So there's no sliding scale on that. However, if there's a police officer that's making $42,000 a year, we'll take 35% of his income. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. And we'll apply it to what he can pay for rent. Mm -hmm. So on our small one bedroom, Jared, uh, how, how much, what's the rent on that? Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, so 35% of $42,000 is going to qualify uh, that type of resident right. for that unit. Now, 
it, it's solely based on a, a on an underwriting standard mm -hmm. to what we think is uh, a, a resident can afford to pay. So that's that's my point. I mean, we're we're talking about the people that are occupying those units are going to make sixty thousand dollars a year, you know. At but that's the most they can make. Um, mm -hmm. It could be down to you know sixteen thousand dollars a year, at which point their you know rental in, you know the amount of rent they're paying would be proportionate to that. Correct? No. No. Because again, we use if it, let, let's just pick a simple number, forty thousand dollars. What's thirty five percent of forty thousand uh, dollars? Thirteen hundred bucks. So a person making sixteen thousand dollars a year would be able to qualify for 35% of $16,000. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any units that rent for I that. See. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. I do want to say, you know, I have to amend you. It looks like a beautiful unit. Um, and I appreciate you for meeting with us. Um, but, you know, what comes to mind here is, to me, um, you know, taking this property and potentially putting something in there like that was at a lawn or that we see in Alamo Heights, you know, where you have restaurants in the bottom and then you have, and, and maybe I'm just, I, I just, my concern is, I think our incoming Castle Hills might be because we have a large amount of retired people here. Um, and we have to look at the future, what direction we are taking our city, um, you know, and that's, that's, I guess what I want to say, it, it is beautiful. And I, and I, I'm coming away a little less firm on my opinion than I came in with, but, um, but I do want to think about those things. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bart Knight. I live at 106 Herwick. Uh, I'm Bart Knight. I live at 106 Herwick. Is that better? Okay. So you're building this to sell it? Yes, we're merchant developers. Okay, so what is to stop the people from buy, who buy it from changing those policies of no Section 8, uh, the income ratio, let's, let's and keep it down, things please. like that? Great, great questions. Um, so this transaction is governed by a lease. We, we, while we're the owner, we're really not the owner. We have a leasehold interest with the city of Castle Hills. So that lease, just like uh, Best Buy has a lease, there's only certain things that Best Buy can do within a shopping center because they're governed by the lease with the landlord. And in this case, our lease with you all um, is very stringent. It's, uh, it's very particular. One of the, several of the things that'll be governed in that lease are the Section 8 vouchers. And by the way, that is a fantastic program. And that is a fantastic program for, um, for lots of families that struggle. And, and sometimes it fits within a business model and sometimes it doesn't. Within this business model, we're not doing Section 8 vouchers. We're not accepting them. But that's not, I want to say, because we don't think it's a bad program. We just think it's a different program and a different model. So I'd like to say that. Uh, but the, the next, the next uh, buyer has to live with the same um, uh, standards as we do, or they don't, or they buy the deal and let's say they just decide to change it. The city has such a massive hammer that they can drop um, if they're not adhering to it, that um, uh, it, it would be, it would be, they could lose the deal, all of their, all of their capital. And uh, the buyers that I've seen do these kinds of projects, they're very sophisticated. They're generally, um, you know, run by, you know, big pension fund advisors and groups like that. There's just not really a good chance that, that, uh, those kinds of inconsistencies in ownership would happen. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, Stephen Ackley, uh, 118 West Castle Lane. And um, I have an, uh, another economic question, I guess, for you, and that's dealing with the uh, potential rises in AMI and how will that figure into the uh, cost per unit uh, that as, as uh, AMI goes up uh, in future. 
uh, we will be able to adjust our rents um, uh, according to the uh, AMI um, uh, index. Uh, we, we also won't ever have, if I, I was doing a transaction in the middle of COVID and I thought to myself, what if AMI decreases? Um, and, 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 you know, I'm looking at a much different, a lower rent than I would be if, uh, if, if, if we didn't, if it was, if it was de decreasing and we negotiated in the regulatory agreement that would never, could never be less than what it is today. So that part is bookended, but it could, it will definitely, it will, it will rise. Um, and, and our rents will rise along with it. Real, real quick. Um, we're going to switch to agenda item number two, so we can hear from our bond council and we'll still have an opportunity to answer questions and we'll actually jump on the list here too. Um, we'll proceed to option or item number 2.2 .2, presentation by representatives from the city of Castle Hills legal council Bracewell LLP on the proposed public facility corporation structure and the Castle Hills community development program. Again, we're still going to have an opportunity to ask the questions you need to want you want to ask and the displays will stay up after the meeting for you to come up and look at them as well. Good morning. My name is Jim Plummer. I'm an attorney with Bracewell. I'm here representing the city. I only represent government entities. I don't represent developers. I do this every day. Um, all I do is housing. A lot of very affordable housing and housing like this. And I just want to walk through a couple of things that I think are important for you to consider. Um, the first thing I want to do is to indicate that what you're saying and what your concerns are, are going to be taken into account in the legal documents that we draft. Right now, there is not a single legal document in existence. We haven't even started real negotiations with these people. Your council has not taken a single step in the direction of doing this deal. We are going through an education process and it's a two-sided education process. Um, we will eventually draft a lease and that lease will take into account some of your concerns. So Scott has told you today, he will commit in the lease, there'll be no section eight. The questions about how many people are gonna live in a unit, we will put a structure in the lease that says, and we'll negotiate something with Scott, but it'll probably be two people per bedroom, excluding an infant, and we'll have to define that. So you won't have a situation where there's seven people in an apartment complex. We've got a lot of negotiating to do with regard to traffic. What are they gonna do with regard to the street? How are they gonna rebuild this street for you? What is it gonna look like? And that's part of the reason your council has, has had you come in is they want to know, what do we need to guarantee? One of the advantages of this structure is that the city is in control. They can do this deal, they can not do this deal. We will have a long-term, very detailed document that will address your concerns where we can. But for the next 75 years, if this thing stays in place for 75 years, the city will be the one that will own this building and they will be the landlord and they will have input into this process. If you just allow this piece of land to be developed, we don't know what it would be developed as in the future, but once it's developed, you lose all control. And whatever happens on that tract in the future, your only way to regulate it is by virtue of code enforcement. And so part of the advantage of doing this transaction is to have you in control on a long-term basis. Um, we haven't gotten a lot of questions today about how do we know this is going to be a nice apartment project 30 years from now? A very valid concern. 
there's two things that are important to consider. One is you've got 50% market rate rents. So they have to behave like other high-end market rate apartments. And, and, and I do tax credit deals every day, but they have no incentive to increase the value of their property. And this deal, these guys only make money by increasing the value of their property. And so they have a built-in economic incentive for this to remain a very nice property. The second thing is we'll put in a provision that says it has to remain a class A apartment project. We are proposing in that definition that it has to be of similar structure, similar maintenance, and we're gonna try and identify some apartment projects that it has to be maintained to the same level of. We've also proposed, and I don't know if Mr. Brimer is gonna agree, that we actually have third parties go in and look. Not, not up to the city, we'll hire an engineer to go in and review the complex and come back and give us an opinion about what needs to be done and they will have to implement it. One of the questions was, how do we know that the people are actually leasing to the 50% tenants? We will require an annual audit by a third party. So these documents will be in place to give you a level of protection over an extended period of time. <clears throat> Everybody in this room is nervous about 75 years um, and rightfully so. But that is the only way you can finance this project. I, I've tried and tried and tried to do shorter terms and we can't get them financed. So the 75 years is something that we have to do to make the project work. But I, I, I'll almost guarantee you, this will not last 75 years. Apartment projects have to be rehab, major rehab, long before that. And then the deal will get renegotiated. They may choose to pay taxes. You're a partner in the deal. You're gonna have a say. If this was just another apartment project, they could go do what they want. Once they have their zoning, it's all their show. In this case, you're gonna have a say in whatever happens to this building on a very long-term basis. And I think that's an important protection. And our job is to try and negotiate a document that gives you a level of control on a very long-term basis. And that's what we're gonna try and do. Um, and, and hearing from you helps us because every community has different needs. And we will try to make sure those needs get incorporated in these documents. So there's a lot of you going, well, there's nothing I can look at, there's nothing I can see. And that's very true at this point. But you need to understand that we are in a discovery process. You are in a discovery process. This city will not be bound to do anything until there are answers to all those questions. The steps in the process will be that the city will create a non a PFC, they'll enter into a non-binding term sheet, all the business terms will get laid out, then we'll negotiate a lease, we'll negotiate a development agreement, and we'll negotiate a regulatory agreement. I predict that none of that is going to occur for several months because um, we got to get the answers to all the questions. We got to get some better understanding of some of these issues. And we have to work out some of the, the, the hardships that this project might create on your neighborhood. The, the, what I call the downstream streets, they're not part of this project, but Mr. Brimer has agreed he will study them and then he will sit down with people and try to address any effect this project has on those streets. And it's the process that he's gone through in every one of these deals that we've done with him. And so you do need to realize, I'm sorry, you do need to realize you are in the early stages. Um, we will end up with binding legal documents. Um, I'm not going to try and address the economics unless you have specific questions but I can address 
what is the effect on the other government entities? What's the effect on the school district if somebody would like to discuss that? Um, but I will leave it up to y'all um, as to, to the questions you have, but understand we are in the information gathering phase of this and we will take all your concerns and try and build them into a document to protect you. Um, and then we will eventually bring that to council. And so that's where we are. Um, a lot of things have been studied um, already. Uh, you know, we, we know that the city studied what's the effect on the city itself. Do we need more policemen? Do we need more firemen? And the conclusion is, no, you do not. Um, the, the traffic study has been done. It is being done on the extended streets. We need an engineering study on the drainage. Um, and Mr. Brimer has agreed to provide um, a neighborhood group with an independent engineering analysis. Um, and, and that's, I don't know if it's underway, but I know it's committed to. Um, that's got to be looked at. So we will move along and we will gather information. Um, and, and we will try to build a document that protects this city from those things that are a concern to it. And so that's where we are in the process. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore. I think it's better to answer your questions because <laughs> um, I'm sure people are going to have questions. So, Okay, so at this point, we're going to go to the list that we have for sign-in. Uh, we have uh, Linda Fletcher. Did you need to speak, ma'am? Uh, Mr. Zamarone, can we get Ms. Fletcher the microphone over here in the front? Thank you. Um, you know, as, as you were speaking um, and everybody started showing the photograph of this building, um, I've been a resident here um, since I was 13 years of age. And it seems like history is repeating itself today because there have been buildings, apartment complexes that have been built. I live right at the corner of 103 Phlox Lane and I'm gonna use Lincoln Village as, as an example. It was a very nice place, very nice facility. And if you go by there today, it has gone down. It's turned into a section eight housing place. And I'm sure that the other residents feel the same as I do, that we all work very hard to keep our places tidy. Um, to keep, keep our place. So Pardon me? I just wanted to keep it down so we can hear you speak. To keep our, our homes um, maintained. Um, you know, somebody was giving, given a, um, I guess a salary of retirement people. Well, you know what? We have earned the right to live here all these years and to build something that's in 25 years, 30 years, that's going to turn into Lincoln Village. We don't deserve that. And that's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, next, we have Brenda Urban. Okay, uh, Robert Wynn. Robert Wynn, Robert Wynn, 209 Garden View. Mr. Plummer, I'm an attorney, you're an attorney. You're being paid by the developer, correct? Okay, that makes no sense to me. I'm sorry. If we can't afford to hire a lawyer, we do not cannot afford to be getting into business deals like this. This is a business deal. We need our own representation because you're representing the buyer, I mean, the, the uh, buyer, yes, or the uh, developer, and you're getting paid by the developer. You say you're representing the city, but you get paid by the developer. And in my mind, you represent the developer because you're getting paid by the developer. Now, secondly, this is all premature, they say, but they're all, they've got a zoning hearing was scheduled for March 1st to change this to apartment use. So why are we in preliminary and y'all are changing the zoning? We have no information. We don't even have a written agreement yet. 
you have not even presented the city with anything in writing. I've asked the city manager, where's the written agreement? Where's the written proposal? Nothing. We have nothing. And you're telling me all these numbers out here, and we have nothing in front of us. There's no cost-benefit analysis done. We don't know what this is going to cost the city. All we have is this num these speculation numbers from the developer and nothing in writing. You can't do that in a real estate transaction. Statute of frauds requires you to be in writing. And I, I know you know that. But for the applicant, our developer, this is the application for the zoning. And it states, signed by the developer, this request will not substantially nor permanently injure, injure the rights of all owners of real property affected by the proposed special use project. Therefore, this request will not adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. How do you know that? There's been no study done. Nothing. This is going to affect every citizen of Castle Hills. Every citizen. And for you to say that there's going to be no effect on every citizen of Castle Hills with no evidence whatsoever is not right. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Kim Wynn. Kim Wynn, folks, if we could please keep it down so everybody can hear. Hello, Kim Wynn, 209 Garden View. We citizens have done, we citizens have done all in our power to tell you that this tax giveaway is not what we want. No amount of spoken promises or artists, artists' renderings can make up for the tax revenues being given away if the city council approves this developer's deal. Stop, listen, and think into the future. This is a one-sided deal that benefits the developer. This land is not an eyesore. The economy is booming. This proposed complex with its tax break giveaway is not necessary for our city's future. It's just necessary for the developer's profit margin. We are a wonderful, safe, family and business friendly community. We citizens do not mind paying our taxes because they provide us with the best police and fire protection in the region. We pay our share of these fine men and women's salaries. Don't let the developer receive them for nothing. Okay, next up we have Jill Akins. Okay, you already spoken, Ms. Akins, you're good? I'm Jill Askins, I live at 98 Honeysuckle. My concern with this is the 75 year term. I think that's ridiculous. The last tax abatement that the city of San Antonio granted for a low income project on the east side was for 60 years, which was ridiculous. I suggest that if actually the city comes down to offering a tax abatement, it should be 50% for the first five years, 40% for the next five, and so on down so that this only lasts for a term of 25 years and that the city will still receive some tax revenue from this project instead of giving the whole thing away for 75 years. Thank you. Okay, Leslie Winger. Uh, Ma'am, we're going in order. Leslie Winger, 137 Lou John. I think that the question that people have is why the developer won't pay property taxes like the rest of us have to do. I'm particularly concerned um, partic in light of the 
history of most of the people on this council, why we're interested in depriving the school district, the county, the health system of their taxes by your vote. How does that help? You've always said you were in favor of the greater community, and now you're not. You're taking their taxes away in order for us to maybe have some kind of benefit. What the city will or will not get out of this will, is hypothetical. Nobody bothered to talk to people at the former Wedgwood, now the ensemble. Are you aware of the fact that since that building was sold after the fire, there have been three different owners? And at present, they're only half occupied. Don't assume that this building will be any better. It's not in as good a location. It's not as good a building. I don't know if any of you have been to the ensemble. It's very spiffy, both in the rooms and in the, com in the common areas. So I would say if they're only 50% occupied, based on what I hear from um, their appraisal, if they went to sell that building today, despite the millions that they poured into it, never mind that they still had to buy it, albeit at a bargain basement price because of the fire, they still had to pour millions in, they probably would not take, get a profit. And that's what you're counting on. So I think this is really premature, as other people have said, and you really need to consider what you're getting into. If this is an honest deal, let them pay taxes like the rest of us. Thank you. Sven Borg. Sven Borg. Yes, yeah, Sven Borg, 113 Parade. Uh, I'd like to say that the question I had, I discussed with Councilman Eisbahn, and he gave me a good answer, I think, in terms of the direction that the council is headed with the two plans that are coming before them. One being a comprehensive plan by the um, uh, committee person that was spoke earlier, and the other having to be with the plan that Braswell, with the plan that Braswell is actually putting together with the community development, and the fact that we're on the same wave path for the future. In other words, do they actually dovetail together? And I understand that that is an issue with the council that is being carefully looked at. And so for the benefit of everybody here, it is to understand that those two plans will be coordinated together. Kathy Tarkington. I'm Kathy Tarkington. I've been, I'm at 153 Trillium. I've been here since 1984. We have had a lot of problems here in Castle Hills with tax exempt properties. We've been through hell with Castle Hills Baptist Church and now with Wayside Church. They took properties, homes, pro regular private residences off the tax rolls. We need the tax money. We are the only city in Texas. Mayor, former mayor, the late Bill Martin, went to the Texas state legislature and tried to get some help from them because of our enclosed city being taken over by these properties. The, the state legislature could do nothing for him because we are the only one and there are bigger issues than our little city. Well, here we are in our little city. We do not need some goofy developer coming along, trying to put up property and not be responsible for taxes. We individual homeowners pay our taxes. I'm a veteran, my husband's a veteran. I live across the street from a 100% disabled veteran who was married to a military veteran who was shot in cold blood and lies in Arlington National Cemetery. She should get a tax abatement, not some developer come, he, a fly-by-night guy. He's never done this project before. He worked for somebody else. He didn't share the responsibility. 
No, I don't think so. This does not benefit us at all. Keep our zoning commercial, bring in sales tax dollars. If something like this were to, to, be, to go through, you said it was mentioned that code compliance would check to see that things are done. Code compliance doesn't even do a good job in our own city, including Mr. Lewis over here. Darlene Metter. Good morning. Do you hear me? Good morning, I'm Darlene Metter. I live in Castle Hills for 40 years. I strongly oppose the proposed loft project as I voiced at the last two city council meetings and therefore I oppose the zoning change. I would like to report a major recent UT Austin Law School Research Project, a report on a recent property tax exemption for private apartment developers, section 303.042F. The conclusion is the cost breaks are large for the developer and the public benefits are comparatively few. The developer transfers the land to a public facility corporation or the PFC which then leases the land and any current or future buildings back to a limited partnership controlled by the developer. The city gets paid to participate with unelected officials, the developer who lacks any political accountability to taxpayers. The new amendment does away with one, any protection reporting requirements, two, rent restrictions, and three other protections meant to ensure transparency accountability and delivery of strong public benefits, other than requiring that at least 80% of the units be reserved for household earning less than 80% of the area mean family income. Since 2016, at least 30 of these entities are currently in progress. The exemptions marginal financial return to the PFC are outstripped by the property taxes losses and 100% school tax loss. The new exemption fails to serve the state's affordable housing needs. Texas middle income renters do not need deeply subsidized rental housing. The PFC projects projects discriminate against tenants with vouchers. This was a summary of the UT Law School report, which raises serious concerns and important warnings on 100% property tax exemption under section 303.042F and whether it should continue and provides 10 recommendations for the city of Castle Hills to take. If the council and mayor who truly represent the citizens, then the decision for rezoning for the loft complex must be placed on the May ballot and take no rezoning actions until the citizens have spoken. If the elected Castle Hill City Council and Mayor Trevino, who I voted for and my family always votes, if they truly represent the citizens who voted for them, then you would like listen to us and not the developer who will be gone like a bandit, leaving the Castle Hill citizens holding the bag for a long 75 years. And I do have an executive summary that I can give to the mayor who can distribute to the council. Thank you. Uh, John Metter. I'm John Metter. I live at 214 Garden View for 40 years, along with my wife. Um, I can recommend to people to look up online the report from the University of Texas Law School concerning PFCs. It's very, it's very interesting. Uh, the issue I have here with all of this is the tax abatement. And I would say that the biggest loser here is the school district, except that that's really not true. They will simply pass on higher school taxes on the rest of us who do pay our taxes. This decision should be made on whether to pursue this or not, should be made by the taxpayers in Castle Hills and not by the city council.
Beverly Ben. Beverly. Beverly Ben. Sorry, my microphone's cutting out. Is Ms. Ben here? Okay. Marion Smith. With all the talk about the money, with all the talk about the money and the expenses and what not we will right. benefit as time goes on, there's not a, been a word about aesthetics. We're talking about something that will be four stories high, looming over our street and inviting more of the same. We will have a lineup like they do on Broadway. They, there will be ways to find and change our city into apartment city if we follow with these plans. Thanks. Brother William Dooling. Brother William Dooling, 201 Gladiola Lane. Um, my main concern, and I have given this speech on various projects over the years, that you know you really need to be careful what you wish for when you go to build something because there's a lot of unintended consequences. And um, I agree with Ms. Fletcher about Lincoln. Uh, village. I remember visiting people there it was a high end luxury place. Not so anymore, but that's in San Antonio. But across the street in Castle Hills, there's the I don't even remember the names of them. Uh, Arden. Well, I don't I can't remember, but there's two apartment complexes across from Lee High School that um, were built in Castle Hills. So I don't know who was responsible for that. But if you if you were to go do an inspection tour, I think you'd have to agree with Ms. Fletcher. So the issue becomes this lease, which I, I still didn't hear anybody say, does the lease last for 75 years with the city being the landlord owner through all of these uh, smoke and mirror legal things? And in the new owners that flip this several times are they assuming that lease or is it renegotiated every time? Because um, the history of these kinds of buildings, Sunset Ridge notwithstanding, Dijon notwithstanding, go all around San Antonio, apartment developers are interested in one thing, make their money and run. The next one comes, makes because it goes down, they buy it at a fire sale, they make their money and run. And that's all that ever happens. Um, so that concerns me. And the tax abatement, I, I just don't understand. Oh, I understand why it's done, but I don't agree with it in terms of if it's such a good city to build such a high end development, do it yourselves. Why should we do it? Thank you. And Mr. Plummer, Mr. Brimer, if there's any point that y'all want to chime in and add comment, please let me know. Um, yes, sir. I tried to, I tried to write, I tried to write down uh, the questions that were, or the, the comments that were coming so quickly. I am a bit of a goofball, so, uh, you know, thank you for that. Um, the, the, the reason we can't do the tax abatement for less than uh, 75 years in, in the lease for 75 years is it's not financeable. Um, if I could build this as a market rate apartment project and get the rents to achieve that, I can promise you I wouldn't be sitting here on a Saturday getting abused. It would not be happening. I'd build it. I'd go for my zoning and we would we would do it. Uh, this is a, um, you know, I understand the comments. I understand the concerns. Yes, we are getting uh, an incentive to come here, but there are probably 15 or 20 other projects that have occurred in San Antonio, just like this, that have all been successful. 
and been successful for the sponsoring entity, the city or the San Antonio Housing Trust or these other entities. And there, you know, the, the, the UT um, report that's been out there, you know, there's two sides to a pancake. Uh, Heather Ray has one side or Heather Way, I believe her name is. And um, the, the, the other folks uh, who, who benefit from these. So the, the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a disingenuous not to look at both sides of this, uh, this argument. I, I would like to say Jim Plummer had nothing to do with our zoning application. We have a uh, zoning attorney that makes the, puts the applications together. And I assume that that language about it not being uh, a detriment to the community is probably just standard, um, uh, uh, application um, uh, jargon that, that, that's used. And your planning and zoning commissioners will make that determination if it is a, if it is a detriment or if it's a danger or creates a, a problem for the community. Not us and not even your city council. The planning and zoning will, will make that determination. Um, Yeah, I, you know, I, I it, it, it honestly breaks my heart to be in, in, in an environment where uh, there's not a real uh, consensus on something. And, um, and I don't like being involved in that. So I, I'm hoping that we can, uh, we, we can find a way uh, to get through this or not in, in, in a re relatively um, uh, quick time frame because this, this is a very you know, painful process in y'all, and it's a it's a stressor on the community, and 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 uh, I just if I lose on the facts, I'm okay losing on the facts. I, I I don't like losing on disinformation, and and there's been a lot of things that just aren't accurate here. We um, seen any paperwork. Not there's not gonna there's not gonna be any pa there's not gonna be any paperwork until until there's a, a, an inclination on the city to move forward, and then there will be there'll be reams of paperwork that protect the city. If, if I, this okay. Is such a great project, what okay, real quick. I'm sorry? If this is such a great project, yeah. why aren't they being rented for higher rents so that we get people of the same quality as the homeowners in Capitol Hill? Okay. First of all, if I could get higher rents here and do it as a market rate deal, it would already been done. It's not available in this market to do it. So that's why we're proposing this structure, in my opinion. So we would have already done it. If we could get Alamo Heights rents here, I'd be doing it. I wouldn't be talking to you guys about a tax abatement, but we are because the rents aren't at a level where we can achieve that. Okay, real quick. Well, uh, we made it, this, yeah, uh, anyhow. Sorry, my mic. Somebody's microphone. Okay, sorry, my microphone is cutting out. It's gonna be a little bit difficult. We're about two minutes from it being over. There are 10 other people that have signed up to oh. speak. Out of respect for all, y'all saw that, right? Out of respect for all of them, uh, I wanna make sure that we get to everybody that signed up to speak. Next up is Mr. Wayne Carter. Wayne Carter, 125 South Winston Lane. I have the distinct honor of being the longest living resident in Castle Hills, 1946. <clears throat> Bill Stedman used to stand up here years ago and quote the same things. I'm following in a fellow engineer's footsteps. History repeats itself. I stood over there 20 years ago talking to the same size audience about what a 480 car parking lot would do to our neighborhood. I'm reminded of a baseball flick, Kevin Cosner's, A Field of Dreams. The notable quote in there was, build it and they will come. I'm not worried about drainage. The topography will take care of that they'll collect it and they'll dump it on the Boy Scout Park. But the traffic, as everyone has said, discounting all of the financial and the public finance corporate, discounting all that, 
build it, and they will come to our recently approved rural residential district neighborhood. Because the city of San Antonio has said no ingress, egress on La Selma. TxDOT did the same thing on Military Highway. So that leaves us to absorb that traffic. The traffic will come into our neighborhood at the traffic light on Winston Lane because we all want to get to work on time. We all want to come home on time. People take shortcuts. History repeats itself. When West Avenue was widened, it was one way north. And what did the good then pr pr uh, principal of Antonian High School do? He built a parking lot and an entrance on Fox Hall Lane. And that taught all the parents and the speeding teenagers to come down Winston Lane, Fox Hall Lane to school. It took my deceased wife and I three years to talk to the principal to get him to close that gate down. But the imprinting is still there. I, I, I badger the, our, our Captain Wagoner about all the cut through traffic that comes through our street morning and evening, running the stop sign, doing 50 miles an hour that I have clocked. People will come down Winston Lane to get out of that queuing at West Avenue and Military Highway, unless something is done. And a lot of the something done is emotional that doesn't work forever, or it encumbers us residents getting in and out of our neighborhood. So we're going to encumber us by building a 450 parking lot facility on the other side that has no way to get out except North Winston Lane coming to Military Highway. That's what's going to happen. I assure you, traffic studies, okay, it's been 50 years with cobwebs on my, on my background on traffic engineering. Traffic engineering studies take empirical data, but they also put assumptions in there. And those assumptions are taken from wherever the person doing the study. So you can, I'm not gonna say what we're waiting for is my good neighbor, Peter Bella said, the traffic study, we're waiting for that. But that can be skewed. I've seen it done. I've seen it done over and over in my career. So we need to be careful. We need to be mindful. I know the city manager and the council and our attorneys are going to try, try to ask for the best if this thing gets railroaded in here. But I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the six of y'all, build it and it will come into our neighborhood. It will come into our neighborhood, mark my word. West Avenue showed us that. History repeats itself. It is imprinted now for traffic to come through our neighborhood to get out and get to where they're going. I'm struggling over here. I don't know what's, okay, there we go. Uh, Don Mendoza. If you want to come up to the microphone, or we can take you in. Hello, my name is Dawn Mendoza. My, I live at 107 South Winston, so I would live literally catty corner to this new apartment complex. Um, I've seen how the traffic does come down Winston, and it has a big impact on us. I think with a 300 unit apartment building, there would be at least, I think, more like 600 cars and that would have a big impact on uh, the, that intersection can't handle that much traffic every morning and every evening. Um, I think they would take shortcuts through the neighborhood. And even if they didn't, it would make a lot of traffic right there at that intersection. Also, I wanna say that I, there are a few apartment complexes that are still nice after 75 years. So I don't think it's a good deal. And I don't think the um, tax-free deal for 75 years is a good deal for Castle Hills. We're, we are about four minutes over, but we still have six people signed up to speak. Uh, James Sharkey. Hi, James Sharkey, 213 Garden View. So my wife and I have moved down here about four years ago because of the quality of life. Frankly, we love it. 
it's the right fit for us. And I guess the heart of the question isn't whether or not we have the right parking lot or drainage. And yes, all that is, those are concerns. The big issue is PFC. Is it the right fit for the city? You can look at any research. You can find studies say, yeah, they're great. You say a lot of studies say, maybe not. There's a lot of concern over it. I think probably more to the negative from what my research has shown. But the question is also whether or not it's a good fit for Castle, <clears throat> excuse me, for Castle Hills. Castle Hills is a small city compared to most of the areas that I've looked at. Taking on a PSC, downtown San Antonio, as an impact to their total population, minimal compared to what we're looking at. The impact to sit in Castle Hills is significant. We have no experience with it. And while it may work somewhere else, I have a lot of doubt that'll work here. Ultimately, do we really need this project? If this project didn't happen, our quality of life is not going to deteriorate. Ultimately, we're looking at making a long-term commitment for the residents here and future residents that haven't even been born. So is that the right thing for us to do? I don't think so. Thank you. I'm, I apologize. I might get this one wrong. Miles Schneider, my, my, something Schneider on North Chris. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm actually Dina Schneider. Mike's my husband. Uh, so we live on North Crest. We moved here about nine years ago. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a businessman. If I was, I'd be living out on my hundred acres somewhere nice and quiet. But I'm a nurse. I just have an average job. We moved here. I can't articulate any better than our other residents have. We moved here for the quality of life. We moved here for the nice, quiet family atmosphere that it affords. We live on North Crest, which is a cut through street as it is. Our cat was run over just a few months ago because of the traffic. Frank sitting behind us, our neighbor, his wife Nina sits outside and calls nonstop about the traffic. The people speeding to try and get on the on-ramp to get onto 410. It is very frustrating. And so regardless of the money that's involved in this, because that is not my strong suit, looking at the finances of this, I'm looking at the quality of life and why I moved here. And I hope that that's taken into consideration along with the monetary issues that go along with this, because we came here for our little piece of the American dream. And I'm hoping that it doesn't get destroyed by this high concentration apartment complex that's gonna be built possibly just down the street from us. Thank you. Next up, we have Dean Aiken. My question's been answered, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Bernard Schneider. I am Bernard Schneider. I live at 208 Sheffield. I've been here about 35 years. My, my concern is, is more on the financing side of the whole deal. If you want to pick up the, the microphone just a little bit. All right. Is that better? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, I, I heard some comments. There's a lot of comments that were made. It's kind of unverifiable and don't in, in conflict each other. I'm basically a CPA, so I'm concerned about the finance side of it. But one of the things that the developer said, and I, I'm sorry I missed your name. I know they called you other things, but <laughs> he said uh, he said that uh, the, uh, the the abatement, the tax abatement was only uh, was required by the city to provide the low income housing. Okay, now that really bothers me because basically when you strip all of this other stuff out, then the city of Castle Hills is paying for the low income housing by giving them a tax abatement. Now I don't, you know, I may have missed something in there, but that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if they wanted to build it, it's a beautiful place looks like, they wanted to build it and rent it as a, you know, forget about the low income housing and give up the, the tax abatement, I think that's fine. Although I understand there's problems that other people have, but from a finance standpoint, I think that's fine. The other thing was I am concerned about the parking. Now, I had a question about the parking, like the, do the tenants have to pay for their parking spaces? I've lived in an apartment over uh, 
uh, over at the quarry for a while. And, you know, you had to pay for every parking space. Well, some people didn't get a parking space. You know, there were lots of parking around there. Well, I don't see where anybody who didn't have a parking space would park in there other than in some of the other uh, businesses parking lots. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. The other thing is all of the money and all the benefits that the city is going to get, it says, um, and, and there really wasn't a whole lot of detail on that, but uh, the fact is, is that if, if it were not, if they didn't have the abatement, the numbers that would, would, of taxes would continue to grow over this period of time. The comment about, in, in, uh, about at the point where the thing closed or whatever that the city would get instead of $8,000 a year, they would get 30 times the amount or whatever, but it's not, it's not an ending payment. It's, it is to pay for fees. Well, okay, the fees had to be there to support something. The, you know, the, the cost of having that building and that property is, right now it's very little. I mean, it's just un, unimproved land, but there will be other costs associated with it. It's trash and it's, um, you know, inspections and police and fire and all of these other things. Uh, so we get, we're getting the, the, the nice side of it, the revenue side that comes to the city. But, uh, but if you look at the other way, if it were, if the property were built, didn't get a tax re, uh, uh, abatement and had, uh, 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 anyhow, the, the, the taxes would go up periodically. Not only that, every time it was sold, which it sounds great that the city would get 25% of the net profit on the sale, but if it was, if it was a, uh, if, if we weren't involved, the city was not involved, um, that new price would go into the tax value of that property. So the taxes would automatically go up when it's sold. Anyhow, it's, it's just a lot of things that are said. I tried to, cover as much as I could and take notes, but I missed them. But anyhow, those were my concerns. Uh, David Lewis. My name is David Lewis. I live at 212 Hibiscus. And uh, my parents were involved very much with the city council and zoning back in the days when the Baptist church battle was going on. And so I've kind of relived this and this project has some similarities, but actually, I mean, as a developer, general contractor, my feelings would first be, I love the idea of a $65 million project in the outskirts of Castle Hills. But there's a real problem that I see and everything that everybody's spoken about, I don't necessarily agree or disagree because there's so many opinions on what's pretty and what's not pretty, how many, how many cars there's gonna be. But the finances of it is something that is not opinion. And to begin with, I was very disappointed at the presentation that we would be getting 30 times our you know, $8,000 immediately upon this deal. Well, first off, it's four acres plus. Even when I buy a lot for $250,000 for half an acre, uh, that land being commercial is probably worth about 2 million, 3 million. And the taxes on that is about 3%. So that should be between 60 and $90,000 or thereabouts a year right now. And whoever buys this land, if this is a tax abatement to the church or however they're getting this $8,000 bargain, whoever uses this land is automatically going to be paying that much in taxes. The other thing is, is it sounded like it's either this or nothing. Either it's a 65,000, $65 million building, or we're just not going to get anything for the next 75 years. And I look at opportunity cost. It's $65 million. If you're actually charging the 3% taxes, that's $2 million a year for everybody. Castle Hills is about a sixth of that. So you're looking at 300, 325,000 a year. Now I do believe we will not see another $65 million project for that property ever. 
I think this is a once in a lifetime deal as far as the greatest value that we can get on that piece of property. But if you look at opportunity cost, let's say that you only got a $20 million commercial deal. Well, with the $20 million, you would still be getting Castle Hills itself is close to um, $100,000 a year or for the entire uh, city. I mean, for a county, everybody else around $600,000 a year. So it's not all or nothing. We can use that land for another purpose and still get tax money. But I'm still trying to figure out why we're only getting $8,000 a year. And I have to only assume that it's uh, either school or uh, religious reasons. So there's been some, what I consider a little bit of misleading information on what we're actually going to get and what we might never get. The other thing is though, is that when you start talking about 25% of the net profits, well, as a businessman, I can show net profits in many different ways legally. And let's start with, that was after an 8% return to the developer. All right, so 65 million times 8% is $5.2 million a year. That's a pretty nice profit. That comes off the net profits. When you resell the, the uh, project, I have no idea, you know, maybe in five years, it'd be worth $30 million more or something. There's, there's no way to tell that. But the one thing that we do need to do is to make sure that a third party auditor CPA comes in and does the performance because what we've been told here today is basically voodoo economics. Thank you for your time. Okay, next up we have Maria Dominguez. I've heard a lot of keywords this morning, lots of keywords, and I really agree with just the last gentleman that spoke. We need an independent person to really come and put a pencil to all of this and give us real information. We've heard the hard side of it from some of our elder people that have been here many years. I've been here 30 plus years, and I too came to this neighborhood like some of our younger people for the life of the neighborhood, the history that this neighborhood had. And I have been very, very happy here. I also heard another key word, retirement. Um, there, we know that most of us are not gonna be here 75 years from now. Do you think you're gonna be here 75? That when you put your signature on those papers, you're gonna be here 75 years from now? You lie. So. <laughs> Whatever decision we make today, it's not the city of Castle Hills. This is the city of Castle Hills. And that's why we have to make that decision the right way. Because we have homes that we wanna sell later on. Have you looked lately on the website how many homes are for sale in our neighborhood? $450,000, $550,000 homes. A lady spoke over there about our median income. Are those homes going to sell? How are we valuing our neighborhood when we add things like this? How do we compare ourselves to Alamo Heights? Santerra's killing us. And what are we doing about it? Adding more to our schools, adding more to our city that we cannot afford to do I'm ready to go out the door. I'm looking for a pay place like Escala to go live in the retirement home. But when I sell my house, am I going to get that money back when we have this kind of stuff come to our neighborhood? Think about that. What are your grandchildren going to do in this neighborhood? That's what I'm going to leave you with today. Thank you. Okay, next we have Grace Delgado. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Grace Delgado at 106 South Garden View. First, I do want to commend the uh, council for always looking ways for uh, the revenue to come into to Castle Hills. And it's very important, as we all know, that we are landlocked with a lot of nonprofit that doesn't pay taxes. So for you to continue to look to ways for our revenue to come into the city, I do commend you highly. My question is this, <clears throat> what is the motive and in and, and the grand scheme of things? If a developer is willing to come in, put something down here, they already told us they're probably going to sell it in five years. So we're, we're going to be married to that contract for 75 years. And they're going to go off on somebody else's honeymoon. They're never going to ever come back to this marriage again. They're going to continue to have one spouse after the other and go to another different honeymoon. They're going to forever be on a honeymoon. And we're going to be married to this one particular commitment. I just want to, again, thank you for always looking ways to drive the revenue, but think about, uh, you really want to get married to this for 75 years. Thank you. Thank you. So we're about 20 minutes over. I, I think that the developer is going to stick around to answer some questions. Hopefully we haven't scared them off yet. Uh, we, this will be up on the agenda for, for, for additional discussion this coming Tuesday at 6.30. It's 1151. I entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm sorry, I went through the whole list and I checked each name off. I'm sorry, I thought you already spoke. Sure. Well, I, I have a question, so I think you have to I do want to thank you all for your, what you're doing, and I, and I think it's a, a good effort to try to maximize piece of property and um, look for the future of Castle Hills. Um, and that is my really my only concern. Um, I've been selling homes in San Antonio for over 20 years, and I've always loved Castle Hills. Um, it has not been a neighborhood of high turnover because people move here and stay here. And that's why we have, I think, a, 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 we have had a high level of retired people living here um, because they've stayed, they've made this their home. And so being landlocked, we don't have the opportunities the city of San Antonio does to annex and keep growing bigger and having more opportunities. We have what we have. So I, I do think it's very important to maximize those opportunities. Um, and as a realtor, I always look at what it's doing to our home values. Um, and and that's, that's key for me. Um, I do intend to make this my home. I, um, I'm on the backside of closer to retirement than not. Um, but in the last few years, I do see a lot of young families coming into Castle Hills. And it's exciting to me to see that. Um, and I just, whatever decisions we're making, you know, looking at the big picture and making smart decisions for the future of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adjourn. Okay, we have a first, do we have a second? Second by Mr. Paul, all in favor? Unanimous is 1153. Everybody enjoy the rest of their Saturday. Thank you for joining us.